Radio Voice Italia. Philadelphia. Class is now in session. Christopher Columbus University is on air from Philadelphia and broadcasting worldwide from within the shadow of Marconi Plaza. Radio Voice Italia is proud to present a recurring segment with civil rights author, professional researcher, and renowned Christopher Columbus expert, Robert Felix Petron Esquire. Buongiorno tutti and welcome to Radio Voice Italia's Christopher Columbus University, where we teach you the truth about the greatest hero of the 15th and 16th centuries, Christopher Columbus, and update you on the international efforts to preserve Christopher Columbus's legacy. I'm your host, Il Professore Robert Petron. Today on our Christopher Columbus University segment, we have some news updates on the worldwide fight for Christopher Columbus. Hold on to your hat, folks. In Rochester, New York, on the heels of a resounding victory by that city's Italian-American community in succeeding in overturning Mayor Lovely Warren's removal of the Little Italy designation of Rochester's historic Italian neighborhood from the city's map and neighborhood directories, Neighborhood Service Director Daisy Algarin, in a counterstrike of malice and petulance, has organized a national night out with all Northwest Quadrant neighborhood groups, except the two Italian-American-led organizations in the Northwest Quadrant, Rochester's Little Italy Association and the Lyle Lotus Neighborhood Association led by Mike Visconti. Mr. Visconti, an Italian-American, was in fact the first person to organize the national night out event in Rochester over 30 years ago. And now Director Al Garin is excluding his organization and the Little Italy Association from the event. Unlike any of the Rochester neighborhood groups that are invited to the National Night Out uh, event, Rochester's Little Italy organization is actually designated a 501c3 nonprofit organization, which files tax returns each year and engages in philanthropic work, such as feeding hundreds of needy families and paying for neighborhood improvements something none of the other neighborhood organizations that Director Al Garin did invite to the National Night Out event have done. Once again, proclaiming to champion diversity and inclusion, the city of Rochester, through Director Al Garin, is engaging in exclusion and bigotry. More opposite speak from Marxist domestic terrorists disguised as politicos. And if you think calling Daisy Algarine and Rochester Mayor Lovely Warren domestic terrorists is overly harsh, in additional news, Mayor Warren was indicted on felony charges last week, including weapons charges and endangerment charges. That's right, folks. The mayor of Rochester and her husband are facing felony indictments. The other Rochester terrorist, Director Daisy Algarine, and a group of at least eight others who go by the collective alias Simonda Grump on social media claim to be working together as a, quote, team to stalk and harass Silvano Orsi, the founder of Rochester's Little Italy Historic District. Al Garin and her terrorist organization have threatened and intimidated Mr. Orsi and his community partner organizations that work with the Little Italy Association filed false crime reports with the police, IRS, state troopers, and governor's office, and have posted scathing rants on local and national media outlet websites, including the Facebook page of the White House, stating that Mr. Orsi, are you ready for this? Quote, deserves to be beaten to a pulp, kidnapped, dismembered, chopped up and stuffed in the trunk of their car. End quote. Director of Security of Rochester Institute of Technology's Henrietta Campus, James Entwistle, had to issue bodyguards to protect Mr. Orsi at an Italian-American event held on campus as a result of the threats made by Al Garin's terrorist group. And she is Rochester's neighborhood service director. It seems so surreal, yet it is real. 
In Pueblo, Colorado, where Christopher Columbus Day has been renamed Francis Cabrini Day, Marxist terrorists are calling for the removal of not only the Columbus Monument in downtown Pueblo, but also for the removal of the four Medal of Honor statues at the Pueblo Convention Center, commemorating Pueblo's four Medal of Honor recipients from World War II, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War, those latter two wars being fought against Marxist aggression in Northeast and Southeast Asia. Coincidence? The Columbus Monument Protection Project asks all listeners to write or email the local representatives of Pueblo, whose email addresses I can provide you if you contact me at my website, preservecolumbus.us, to register your firm but respectful demand to keep the Christopher Columbus Monument and Medal of Honor statues in place. Once again, you can get the necessary addresses by contacting me at the viewer feedback tab of preservecolumbus.us. In Chicago, Illinois, the Italian-American community has organized an event in Arrigo Park called Pack the Park for Italian Unity Day to mourn and protest the bigoted removal of Chicago's three Columbus statues and the subsequent violence that has ravaged Chicago since. In New York City, the Epoch Times has filmed an interview with Dr. Mary Graybar, resident fellow of the Alexander Hamilton Institute for the Study of Western Civilization, for their new film, America Rewritten, a documentary on how history is being falsified and how the system of government is being misrepresented. The film features interviews of many leading experts, such as Victor Davis Hanson, Dinesh D'Souza, Rick Green, Trevor Loudon, Thomas K. Lindsay, Kevin Roberts, Craig Parshall, Dustin Bass, and K. Lloyd Billingsley, and explores what the world would lose if the American Constitution were lost. In the film, released on July 6th, Dr. Graybar discusses with host Joshua Phillip how the late Marxist propagandist Howard Zinn dishonestly presented America's history and founding in his best-selling A People's History of the United States. His intention was to subvert faith in constitutional principles and inspire hatred of America among students who are often assigned the book by their teachers. Dr. Graybar describes how Zinn, quote, pretended to be uncovering a long lost theory about how the founders designed the American government to protect their own wealth, power and class interests. To the contrary, Dr. Graybar explains, this theory had been thoroughly discussed and debunked many times over, and America has been rightfully seen as the place where people could come to elevate themselves by their own efforts. In the first chapter of her 2019 book, Debunking Howard Zinn, Exposing the Fake History That Turned a Generation Against America, Dr. Graybar addresses the slander against Christopher Columbus that Zinn maliciously and falsely peddled to the educational institutions. Dr. Graybar's debunking Howard Zinn, exposing the fake history that turned a generation against America, is currently available at your local book retailer and wherever books are sold. In the Boston, Massachusetts area, a collection of approximately a dozen Italian-American organizations have collectively sent a letter to Massachusetts Italian-American Legislative Caucus member Senator Salvatore Di Domenico demanding help from that caucus in combating the anti-Italian-American terrorism in Boston. Their letter reads, in part, Italian-Americans have become increasingly aware that our ethnicity and our heritage are being targeted by forces within our country as part of a political and cultural struggle. Christopher Columbus was the first victim. Statues to Columbus have been desecrated or removed. His name has been removed from public buildings. His great achievements debased in public school curricula and celebrations in his honor have been increasingly terminated. Moreover, this has spilled over into other areas. Holy symbols of faith have also been desecrated with Italian slurs, insults, and brazen expressions of hate for those of Italian descent are on the rise. We can no longer quietly abide the insults to our heritage, our culture, and our persons. Italian Americans are grateful for the opportunities offered by America. We continue to deeply value our heritage and we love America dearly. Indeed, we have shed our blood for her. We reject bigotry in all its forms because it is inherently wrong and because it divides us as a people, an American people. Yet, 
we find that there are forces in America that wish to pit Italian Americans against other ethnic groups in order to achieve their particular goals. We see this for what it is, and we vehemently reject it. We, the presidents, on behalf of their members and the Italian American community, are reaching out to you, the Massachusetts Italian American legislators of both political parties, to express our concerns and solicit your help. We would therefore appreciate a meeting with the Massachusetts Italian American Legislative Caucus at the earliest possible time. Wow, it reads like the Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson would be proud. I encourage you to use this letter as a model to write to the Italian American Caucus of your own state's legislature to voice your demands and to preserve Christopher Columbus's holidays and monuments in your state. On the substantive portion of today's class, we're going to discuss what I mean when I say the primary sources of historical record. I've referred to these many times in previous episodes and will continue to do so. We're going to talk about what that means today. So the detractors of Christopher Columbus, whatever you want to call them, the revisionists, Marxists, globalists, ignoramuses, liars, terrorists, mayors, school boards, take your pick. They do not rely on the primary sources of historical record to spew their false slander against Christopher Columbus. What they rely on are, at best, somebody else's secondary sources, but usually, even worse, Howard Zinn's book, A People's History of the United States, which is not even a secondary source. At best, it's a tertiary source, but I wouldn't even really call it a source at all, but rather a sourceless polemic. Now, I'm going to do a future episode on debunking Howard Zinn's book. I'm going to discuss in that future episode the book I mentioned in the news portion of today's class, Debunking Howard Zinn, written by historian Dr. Mary Graybar. I have read it, and it is quite good, and I am also going to invite Dr. Graybar onto this show for a future episode. But for now, suffice it to say that in the measly chapter that Howard Zinn dedicated to Christopher Columbus, Zinn fails to fight any, cite any sources. Now, now, that's right. Zinn's book isn't even about Christopher Columbus. It's a superficial anthology about all of the history of America. And Columbus is only a small portion of the book in the beginning. And all these detractors, these Marxist adjutants disguised as mayors, city councils, school boards, and educators, are all relying on a small portion of a larger work by Zinn, which fails to cite any sources. Yes, you heard me. Howard Zinn didn't cite any sources, much less primary sources of historical record for his book. Instead, he just glommed portions of another book written by a friend of his whom he knew from his anarcho-communist circles. Now, this other anarcho-communist author also didn't cite any sources, much less any primary sources of historical record. And that's why Zinn didn't either. Now, Zinn's friend didn't sue him, either because he didn't know Zinn had plagiarized him or didn't care. Or perhaps they were just more concerned with getting the lies out there by any means necessary. And they did. And it worked. And the educational system ate it up. How? Well, that's a topic for an episode in and of itself. But suffice it to say for this episode that the Frankfurt School, a Marxist school of philosophy, gained a great deal of traction in the universities in the West in the latter half of the 20th century. By the 1990s, they had gained traction in high schools. Now, they have acquired a stranglehold on our grade schoolers, as can be demonstrated by all the parental backlash in places like Loudoun County, Virginia. And if you haven't been following that story, you should. Look up Loudoun County, L-O-U-N-D-O-U-N. Uh, you can also look up Ian Pryor. That's a father and an attorney who's leading the fight in Loudoun County. His Fight for Schools movement, uh, fellow activist Christopher Rufo, See what's going on in your children's and grandchildren's grade schools. It will sicken you. I looked through my daughter's fifth grade notebook here in Philadelphia, and you know what I found? In her handwriting, in a subject that wasn't even history class, it was a reading and writing class or something, I saw mention of Howard Zinn, his actual name spelled correctly in her handwriting in her notes. Now, how does a fifth grade child write the name of the author of a book they're studying. When did you ever make specific note of the author of your textbook when you were in grade school or even high school? This teacher wasn't just teaching Zinn's lies to the students. She was teaching about Zinn to the students, a self-proclaimed anarcho-communist of the early to mid 20th century 
who was writing defamatory lies about our country and about Western culture. Two fifth graders. All right, before I give myself agita, let's get back to the topic at hand, the primary sources of historical record. What does that mean, primary sources? What makes something a primary historical source? Well, when I refer to the primary sources of historical record about Columbus and the settlement of the West Indies, I'm referring to those accounts of the settlement of the West Indies that were written firsthand by the people who experienced or witnessed the settlement, or the people who personally knew Christopher Columbus and had firsthand contact with him. These are the primary sources. Anything else is based on or extrapolated from the primary sources, and those are secondary sources. And anything based on or extrapolated from secondary sources are tertiary sources and so on. And you know what happens when you extrapolate. It's like that game you used to play as a kid, whisper down the lane. You'd start at one corner of the classroom with a bit of information or gossip like, I don't know, like Mr. Musumeci's grocery store sells whistle pops for a nickel apiece. And then you whisper it into the ear of the kid behind you, and that kid whispers it to the kid behind him, and she whispers it to the kid behind her. And by the time it gets to the opposite corner of the class, it's mutated into something like, uh, Mr. Musumeci was arrested by the FBI on narcotics trafficking charges and running a prostitution ring. And there's always at least one smart aleck in the class who purposefully mutates the information just to see what havoc he can wreak and have a good laugh at the end. Well, that guy was Howard Zinn. Only he didn't do it for laughs. He did it to subvert our country's history as an act of Marxist information terrorism. And the educators and politicians and others who perpetuate this information terrorism are terrorists. While claiming to be acting in the interest of empathy and inclusion and diversity, their usual buzzwords, they place themselves and the members of their political or educational administrations among the liars, villains, and misanthropists of history. Again, another example of opposite speak. But again, I digress. Back to the primary sources. They are finite. The primary sources are limited in number, and they're out there and available to be read. You should read them if you want to be informed about Christopher Columbus, or better, you want to be an advocate and activist for truth. Let's start with the one. I'm going to list about eight. The one I consider to be the most important. Historia de las Indias, or History of the Indies, by Bartolomé de las Casas. This was originally written in three volumes in 15th century Spanish by de las Casas, who was a young settler who lived in the Spanish settlement of the West Indies when it was first founded. He witnessed firsthand the building of the settlement, its eight-year governance by Christopher Columbus. He witnessed the growing recalcitrance of the Hidalgos, the lowlanded Spanish nobles, whose Spanish-born house servants began dying off from starvation and overwork because they weren't used to the hard labor of building a frontier settlement or to growing European crops in the tropical climate of the Caribbean archipelago. They also died of diseases given to them by the tribal peoples. Yes, you heard, heard a lot about how Europeans gave diseases to the tribal peoples, no doubt, but it went both ways, ladies and gentlemen. Also, it bears mentioning that all the diseases Europeans gave to the tribal peoples have been cured by modern science. The same cannot be said of all of the diseases the tribal peoples gave the Europeans, including syphilis, for which no cure has yet been found. Anyway, De Las Casas witnessed the Hidalgos demand Columbus give them Taino slaves to build a settlement for them. He witnessed Columbus refuse, and he witnessed the Hidalgos plotting, scheming, and fomenting and conducting rebellion after rebellion. De Las Casas himself was among the settlers and heard firsthand the Hidalgo's invitations into the conspiracy. He witnessed the benevolent governance of Columbus and the peaceful way Columbus quelled those rebellions with diplomacy, not arms. De Las Casas grew up to be a Dominican friar, and after Columbus's death, went on to be named by the crown of Spain and by the Catholic Church, Protector de los Indios, Protector of the Indians. And he was a vociferous and dedicated protector of the tribal peoples. He wrote very critically of the Spanish Hidalgos and even of the crown, which could have earned him a death sentence. But he was brave and outspoken. And yet this vociferous, dedicated advocate, willing to put his life on the line to criticize his fellow Spaniards and the crown, spoke so highly of Christopher Columbus that the entire opening of History of the Indies is an overflowing, effusive work of praise for the man. De Las Casas names him as the illustrious Genoese Christopher Columbus and describes him as 
good-natured, kind, daring, courageous, and pious. De las Casas marvels at Admiral and Governor Columbus's many acquired qualities, including his masterful calligraphy, arithmetic and drawing, his skill with Latin, his unusual insight into human and divine affairs, good judgment, sound memory and eagerness to learn, intense study and proficiency in geometry, geography, cosmography, astrology or astronomy, and seamanship. Of course, uh, of Christopher Columbus's journals, he noted that as admiral and governor, Columbus, quote, avoided exaggeration in authoring these, quote, documents of value. Historia de las Indias was translated into English in an abridged single volume form in the late 1960s and early 1970s by Professor Andre M. Collar. That's Andre with two E's and Collar, like collared, collared greens. And her masterful translation was published under the title History of the Indies. I assigned it to you to read early in the course, and hopefully you have read it. You can see that uh, what I'm saying is not extrapolation or spin, but flatly and categorically established by De Las Casas' primary source of historical record. Now, why do I consider this primary source to be the most important? Not only is De Las Casas' account of the settlement of the Indies an unbiased one, he actually goes out of his way to be critical of the settlement project because he took his job as protector of the Indians very seriously. As I said, it's the closest thing in existence to an account written by the tribal peoples themselves. De Las Casas was their mouthpiece, and a critical and vociferous mouthpiece he was. And yet, he bears out unequivocally that Christopher Columbus was a good leader, a champion of the tribal peoples, and put his own life on the line in defying and, defying and reigning in the Hidalgos who wanted to enslave the tribal peoples. All right, number two on my list are the journals, epistles, and other writings of Christopher Columbus himself, such as the Book of Prophecies. These are great. They are available in published form and well worth the read. You can hear many of the same accounts from History of the Indies told in Columbus's own words. You can hear his innermost thoughts and really get to know the man. Now, detractors love to quote portions of Columbus's writings out of context, use ellipsis dots, you know, those three periods, to connect disparate passages that have nothing to do with each other in order to give the false impression that Columbus is saying the opposite of what he actually said. And they don't care that they're lying because Marxists see lies as a useful tool to dismantle enemy institutions. It's yet another example of opposite speak being employed by the liars, ignoramuses, and villains who seek to slander Christopher Columbus. But if you read them yourself, in context, in full, you can see for yourself that the detractors are lying to you, and you don't have to take my word for it. Number three on my list is The Life of the Admiral, also published under the title Historiae, an archaic spelling of history, which is a biography of Christopher Columbus written by Columbus's biological son, Ferdinand Columbus, or as he is often called, Fernando Colón, because his mother was the Spanish noblewoman Beatriz Enriquez de Arana, whom Christopher Columbus met after his Italian Portuguese wife, Felipe Perestrello, died in childbirth of their son, Fernando's older half brother, Diego. The Life of the Admiral is a touching account of a father's life written by a son, uh, but at the time Fernando was writing it, he was engaged in litigation over his father's titles and estate. So I don't consider it to be the best of the primary sources because some of the things he says may have been somewhat self serving. But I always get choked up when Fernando apologizes to the reader very earnestly for his scant knowledge of the details of the courtship and brief marriage of his father and Felipa, the mother of Diego. Fernando writes of his father, quote, he died before I made so bold as to ask him about such things or to speak more truly. At the time, such ideas were farthest from my boyish mind. And <laughs> that just really strikes a chord for me because you know, there are so many things I regret not asking my father or grandparents or great aunts and uncles when they were with us. So I encourage you listeners to give a call to that elderly relative of yours, express your love, and ask questions about his or her life that you've never asked before it's too late. All right, number four, De Orbe Novo, which is Latin for On the New World, translated into and published in English as Decades of the New World. 
That's an anthology of letters and reports of the early explorations of Central and South America. These letters and reports were written contemporaneously with or very close in time to the events recorded and are also curated by Peter Martyr of Angleria, an Italian historian, prolific writer and chronicler, and a contemporary of Christopher Columbus. The anthology is called Decades of the New World in the English translation because the original Latin versions published between 1511 and 1530 were grouped into sets of 10 chapters, which were called Decades. Aside from De Orbe Novo, the Annals of History have preserved approximately 800 letters addressed to various and sundry illustrious people of the time with whom Peter was personally acquainted, relating the current events of the time. And his style is very journalistic in some instances and downright gossipy in others. It's actually from Peter Martyr's letters that historians have learned much of the details about the physical appearance, personality, quirks, and anecdotes of many prominent historical figures. But De Urbe Novo is his most notable work. He learned a lot from studying the letters of Christopher Columbus himself and the reports of the Council of the Indies. Peter Martyr was actually the first European to understand the significance of the Gulf Stream, that uh, warm and swift Atlantic Ocean current that originates in the Gulf of Mexico and stretches to the tip of Florida and uh, follows the eastern coastlines of the United States and Newfoundland before crossing the Atlantic Ocean as the North Atlantic Current. Martyr actually wrote six publications giving primary historical accounts of the settlement of the New World, one of which, Oceani Decas, contained 10 reports, two of which were letters about Columbus's voyages that Martyr had written in 1493 and 1494 to Cardinal Ascanius Svorza. In 1501, Cardinal Luigi D'Aragona requested that Martyr add eight more chapters on the voyage of Columbus. And in 1511, he added a supplement, giving an account of events from 1501 to 1511. Number six, Antonio de Herrera y Torcedo Tordesillas, boy, the name is long and complicated, but wait till you hear the primary historical source he wrote. Are you ready for this? Historia General de los Hechos de los Castellanos en las Islas y Tierra Firme del Mar Oceano que llaman Indias Occidentales. Holy cow, that's a tongue twister. It translates to General History of the Deeds of the Castilians on the Islands and Mainland of the Ocean Sea known as the West Indies. Dude, where was your editor when you came up with that title? Now, because that title is so obscenely long, the work is also known by the title Décadas. <laughs> so, Tordesillas was a chronicler, historian, and writer of the Spanish Golden Age, which was actually the 16th century. So, his Décadas was actually written about a century after the voyages of Columbus. But remember... This is the end of the medieval and renaissance eras and the beginning of what historians call the early modern period. So things moved slowly. 100 years is, all right, it's not contemporaneous with, but in those days it was close enough. Tordesillas's Decadas is considered to be one of the best and most complete chronicles of the settlement of the Americas. Number seven, Historia de los Reyes Católicos Don Fernando y Doña Isabel or History of the Catholic Monarchs, Lord Ferdinand and Lady Isabella, written by Andres Bernaldez, an ecclesiastic, historian, and contemporary of Christopher Columbus. Bernaldez served as the chaplain to Archbishop Diego de Deza, Archbishop of Seville, and Bernaldez knew Christopher Columbus personally and had even stayed at his house in Los Palacios and Villafranca, Spain. Bernaldez wrote first-hand testimonies and other documents regarding Christopher Columbus's successes and subsequent trials and tribulations with the Hidalgos and uh, the unsympathetic widowed King Ferdinand. Bernaldez also wrote about other important aspects of Castile at the end of the 15th century, such as the War of Granada and the Inquisition. Bernaldez is one of the primary sources of historical record that most clearly reflects the Genoan origin of Christopher Columbus, aside from the actual archives of Genoa themselves, which contain plenty of Columbus family documents clearly establishing his Genoan origin. And that brings us to the last of my list of primary historical sources, the actual archives of Genoa themselves, which contain plenty of Columbus family documents. 
The annals of history also maintain other legal documents, such as Columbus's last will and testament, and letters to and from some of his other contemporaries. And that's my list of the primary historical sources. Now, if you hear revisionists or other Columbus detractors, including professors and other so-called educators, even from prestigious universities, spewing their false slander about Christopher Columbus and not citing any historical sources, which they always, almost always do, that's because they haven't read any of these. And they are not Columbus experts, even if they're historians. All Columbus experts have read these. And we're all in agreement that Columbus was not only not a racist, rapist, maimer, murderer, slaver, slave owner, grifter, genocide heir, but that he was actually the opposite of those things. He fought against those things. He was actually a good man who cared about the tribal peoples. And I always say he was the first civil rights activist of the Americas. Ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't take a scholar to read these primary sources. If you truly want to fact check me or want to be able to call out the Columbus detractors and other revisionists on their ignorance or Marxist lies, I encourage you to check out these books. Like I said, there's a finite amount. Read them. And who knows? Maybe I can find a place for you as research assistant to Il Professore. And that's today's class. For more news, articles, and resources about Christopher Columbus as the first civil rights activist of the Americas, icon of Western culture, paragon of Catholic virtue, and greatest hero of the 15th and 16th centuries, visit preservedcolumbus.us. That's preservedcolumbus, rendered as one word, dot U-S. And post a little note of appreciation for our webmaster, Tom LaCosta. I'm your professore, Robert Patron. A presto! The Jersey Shore has fun and sun, sand and sea, and radio voice Italian. This is Radio Voice Italia, USA.